Star Wars fans here? Yeah, I've just been stuck behind a black curtain all day. I didn't know that this was all out here, you know. Blue man group over there. How is, how's it going? Returned to the world of Star Wars. What has that been like to go back into it? Yeah, it's been great. It's been really, it's been really um, like a relief almost. You know, it was it was a long, a long time ago that we made the last prequel in 2003. We shot the last one. So um, to come back, I guess it was like almost 20 years later. It was, but it felt good. It felt really. I really like making the series with Deborah Chow, who's just a brilliant director and a great was a great leader of that whole, she directed all of those episodes and um, she really, really understands the world of Star Wars and she really honed the script, she did all the work uh, on the, you know, working with the writers to sort of hone the series and I think she did a brilliant job and it was lovely to work with her and, uh, and a great cast and um, yeah, it was good, it was good fun. Did you feel like you were returning to the same character, or did you feel like it was a different character now that it's been years? Well, yeah, no, it felt like it had to be the same, it had to be, it felt like the same character, just older and a bit tired, tireder, you know. I don't know where I drew that from, but, um, uh, yeah, no, I just, it felt, it very much felt like it had to be him, and I always think of, I mean, when I did the first ones, I was, I was, I must have been like 25 or 6 or something when we started. And the, 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 the challenge there was to be Alec, you know, to be a young Alec Guinness. And so I always start with Alec, I always, I mean, it's such a lovely job to have, to sit and watch his movies. And that's where I always start. So that's what I did this time, I started watching Alec Guinness in the, I watched all the Star Wars films, all of them, I hadn't uh, necessarily seen all the sequels, so I watched all nine films and then I went back to, and then I studied Alex, I got them to put Alex scenes together for me, just, just his scenes, and um, I would watch that and watch that and watch that, and for me it just has to feel like him when I'm, when I'm doing a take as Obi-Wan, if, 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 it, if, it, if it feels a bit like I can imagine Alec in the room, you know, then uh, then I'm happy, and if it doesn't, I'll always ask for another go and to look. I'm not trying to impersonate him, but just like it has to feel like him a bit. You know. It's a vibe thing. So yes. Vibe. Um, speaking of the original trilogy, your uncle Dennis Lawson yes. played Wedge and Tilly's. Yes. Yes. When look you look at the size cast, of that thing. <laughs> when you first got cast, did you call him up and ask him for advice? Well, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, my uncle is my acting sort of. I mean, he's my hero anyway, and he was an actor. I came from a very small town um, in Scotland, and it's not really the kind of place you would imagine becoming an actor from, you know. But my uncle had done it. He, he grew up there, and he went off to become a, an actor in the theatre, and then on television, and then he made um, his, his, his film. Does everyone remember Local Hero? The movie Local Hero? It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch. It's a really, really good film. And um, that was his sort of biggest movie role. And it, somewhere in the middle of all that mix, he did a few weeks on Star Wars. You know, I think they got... <laughs> but George shot the first ones in London, you know, in Elstree, I think. And um, so all of the London-based actors got, got cast in little parts and stuff. And so my uncle ended up as Wedge. And he actually survived all the three, first three movies, you know. Um, I think they, I can't remember if they brought him back for the sequel or if they used his voice. I think maybe they shot with him for a day. Um, so, but I, yes, of course I spoke to him about it and it was, it was an odd one. It, it, you might think it would be like a no-brainer, but it wasn't a no-brainer for me at the time. I'd only done four or five, six movies and I'd, I was involved in Danny Boyle's, I felt like Danny Boyle's actor. You know, I, I made Shallow Grave with Danny and then, um, we made uh, Train Spotting, and then we made thank you, and then we made a third film called uh, A Life Less Ordinary here in the States. And I felt like more than anything, I was Danny Boyle's actor. That was really like the most important thing to me. I felt like I was part of something new, 
and important, like Trent Shallowgrave left a mark on British cinema, and Trent Spotting left a mark on, on you know, global cinema. And so that was my priority, and I, I fancied myself as somewhat of a sort of indie, urban, grungy type actor. And I still rather do, I think. <laughs> but um, so this was a big, de it was a departure, Star Wars, and also just the idea of it was so massive. You can imagine as a young actor, you know, the the it had been it had been a long, long time since the since uh, the the last of the original movies. I don't remember what year that. Someone will know. I mean, somebody must know. Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Thank you. Eighty-three. Okay, so it been since 83 and we were like in, we were in the, in the 90s, weren't they, late 90s when we were starting to do the prequels, so it's been a long time, so the pressure of that and yeah, um, so it was important to speak to Dennis about it. I wouldn't necessarily tell you what he said because it wasn't entirely positive, but <laughs> anyway, he's at the moment doing one of these in Nashville, he's doing a Comic Con in Nashville now. So, you know, we're all both we're both comic conning around now, Dennis and I. So guys. Have you done a show together yet? Have yes we have, we did. We were both in San San Francisco together. Um, and we did one in Edinburgh together. Um, and that has been really fun, yeah. It's been nice. Was the transition from being a Danny Boyle actor to Star Wars, was that huge? Was that weird? Going on set and it's a whole different kind of production? I mean, I think as an actor, every every job is different from the last. They, at least they should be, and so they're always different. Every every role demands a different part of you, and every role has different sort of um, technicalities involved. This was the first film like this. That, well, this is the only thing like this. So, but it was the first time I'd ever done th this much sort of blue screen work, or you know, acting with with things that aren't there and um, work you know with a tennis ball and a stick and then or you know that was the first time I'd ever done that kind of work but I think the responsibility is always the same you always just have to be believable in that role in that story and so everything's always going to feel different it didn't it didn't it didn't feel like a different job I didn't have to be a different actor or anything no I don't think so You've done a lot of Star Wars now, especially with the show. Is there anything in the Star Wars universe that you would like to do that you haven't done yet? <laughs> Obi-Wan season two. Yeah. Someone booing? Someone booed. Who booed? You don't want it? He doesn't want season two. I don't know what this guy. Um, I don't know. I think there's. I think there's definitely. There's a couple of things. I quite like to wear that armor. I was speaking to someone earlier from the Clone Wars. I think that could be a that would be something that I'd enjoy. But I was trying to I was figuring out with someone in the autograph queue today that I would, that would mean I'd have to be young. You know, I'd have to be younger. But there's, I mean, they can do. No, Otherwise, it's like having those. It's the de aging. It's the dots on your face for three months. You know, I'll, I'll do it. I don't care. I think. can really get back together again. Yeah. Okay, so there's that, so there's definitely that is one idea. And the other one is obviously between the end of uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series and when Alec Guinness is uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, there's got to be another few stories in there. And we're definitely uh, hoping, well, exploring that, I think, would be the word to say. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'll take you with me when I go and see Disney. Say, yeah, let's go. Okay, okay, we'll come, come back. So you've been in a lot of movies with big stylistic visions, like Big Fish, Moulin Rouge, Beginners. Lots of fans. What 
what is it like performing in a movie with a very specific stylistic vision versus something more naturalistic? It's all the same. I, I always try and find, I think I've always been looking for something that's got a little bit sort of extra, either a sort of magical quality or, you know, like with Moulin Rouge, the music and the... Just the sort of romance of it. There's something, there's something that really appealed to me, like in the, the the old films that I used to watch when I was a kid. I love it. I, so I'm always looking for something that's got that little extra quality. But this, the job is always the same, you know. Like I say, there's a writer that writes something, and we—that's what we read. That's what the director reads, and that informs us as to what 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 is this? What world are we in? What uh, what the sort of nature of the thing? And then, it, and then, and then, so everything is unique, really. So there's no, there's, there's some things you approach where you have to learn something, like I don't know, you have to learn the bagpipes, or you have to learn to unicycle, or you have to learn French or something in order to play this character. And, and then there's other things, times where you're playing somebody that's actually lived. You know, you're playing somebody who's real, I've done that a few times. I played Halston, who was a real, uh, Harrison, three people, thank you so much. It means a lot to me, thank you, those three people. And um, uh, in the past, I played Nick Leeson, who was a trader that brought down Bering's Bank. So when you're playing somebody who's actually existed, then you can watch their videos or read their writing or whatever. Um, and that's that, that, and then other things you just, you know, you just are come straight out of your imagination. So. There's different sort of lead up to roles, but they're, uh, the on set is always the same job, I guess. It's really interesting. Uh, speaking of unique movies, you played Sebastian J. Cricket in Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Woo! Or you voiced, you voiced him. I read that the role was smaller before you signed on. Is that true? I don't know. I, this is how, this is how, um, <coughs> I, 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 I think it was during, it's just about, lockdown when I, I mean I recorded the song for um, for uh, for Pinocchio in my, in a caravan in my garden with a mic during lockdown because you just have to do everything remotely, you know. But when I, I went in to see Guillermo to do the first, I thought, I was just going in for a meeting to, to meet him, to talk about it. I hadn't been sent the script or anything, so I thought, oh well, he must just want to talk to me about it. So I arrived at the sound studio up near the in, um, where the studios are in Hollywood and I walked in and I was in a sad recording studio and there was loads of people behind the glass and Gail was like hey how are you doing it's nice to see you and, I, and, and, I, and he, shook, he takes me to the lectern where there's the script and the microphone and he goes just we'll start in your own time and I did the, I made a I made a big mistake because I I didn't tell him I just I just thought okay I'm just going to do it I'm gonna, I had no idea. I didn't know who Jim, this Jimmy okay. Cricket was. I knew who the other one, the old one was, but so I just started to sort of blag my way through it as best I could until I, I realised that I, I was going nowhere. And I stopped him and I said, "Gilmore, can I speak to you in here?" And he came in. I was almost in tears, like I was so embarrassed. And I, he sat down and I said, "Gilmore, I, I have never read. I haven't read the script. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just making it up." And um, he did a lovely thing. He, he just he just sent everyone away for a minute, and he sat down and he told me that his version of what he was trying to do. He sort of pitched me the story, told me about how he saw the character, and then I knew what I was doing. Then you know, I knew who, at least who I was trying to play, and then we got on with it. And a lot of what you hear in the film is from that original, you know, <laughs> I had like five minutes preparation for it. You know, but it was fun. I love him, and I love. I love the films he's made. I've always been a big fan of his work. And um, so I'm so lucky to get to work with him. It was a beautiful film. Um, so you sing, you just mentioned singing. You sing in this film, you sing in Moulin Rouge. You once played Sky Masterson in Guys and Dolls. Um, will you do another musical? I'd love to, I would love to. I, I just haven't been offered any. I mean, I really, it's not like I haven't, wanted to do it, and there aren't many, I mean, there's not many musical movies made, there are some, um, and I, I would love it, I love, i tell you what, there was nothing like singing on set of Moulin Rouge, I'll never forget, 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 I'
never forget walking through the tango with the dancers going side to side, you know, uh, and with all that angst. And um, I loved it. I loved, I loved doing it. So, yeah, I would hope there will be more. I just don't know. I just they just haven't come my way yet. But maybe they will. Fingers crossed. Now that it's out in the universe, hopefully. Woo! Speaking of singing, you also did Down with Love with Renee Hellwager. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. This question feels very for me. <laughs> um, you mentioned you're a fan of old Hollywood. Are you a big classic movie fan? Is that yes? I mean, I just grew up watching movies, and I still I love watching. I, mean, I am a bit nostalgic, I think. So I do love watching older movies, and. Um, yeah, definitely loved all those um, comedies, Rock Hudson, Doris Day, um, I, I, you know, Pillow Talk, all of those. I, I loved them. I loved it. I sort of got it. When I read, when I read Down in Love, I, I knew what it was about. Yeah, I certainly did. And it's nice. Uh, Peyton Reed, the director, is still a good friend of mine. Renee, I see now and again. Um, I'm always happy to see her when I do. And um, yeah, it was a great, it was a great experience making that film. It was some, something really, again, that, that sort of extra layer of magic on top that I'm always hoping to find. And you did a big dance number in that. I was wondering, training, and you were kind of talking about this earlier, but training for a big dance number versus training for a fight. Is it very different? Is it the same? Are you just kind of following along? Well, I think the fight, the fight, the fight rehearsals for the latest Obi-Wan series were really intense. So we went for like a good few months before we started filming, we were we were working in a fight gym three times a week, just for fitness as much as anything else, but also learning, drilling all the moves, all the, all the different, you know, it was really well done. Uh, Jojo, our fight coordinator, did a really amazing job at sort of training us. And then, and then slowly learning the choreography for the, for the fights. And then the, when, once you start learning the choreography, it does become a bit like, a learning of a dance, it's the same, you know, you have to be in the right place at the right time, on the right leg, and you know, um, so, so it, it's similar in a way, yeah. It just doesn't hurt quite as much when you get it wrong in a dance, <laughs> as it does with a lightsaber. But Hayden and I, I'll tell you, like, our, in the prequels, our knuckles were like, because we were using metal blades on the lightsabers then, they didn't have, they used the plastic, they're, they're not dissimilar to the ones you have here, that we fight with now, and they actually light up now and stuff, and in the, in the prequels they didn't. We had sort of a, some alloy blade, and there was a guy on the corner of the set whose job it was to just change the blades after every take, and Hayden and I, particularly Hayden and I, when we fought together, would just bet every take we'd have to have a new sword, because we'd bend the blades, we just went at each other really hard, and um, I can't, there's no hilt on these. George Lucas thought we didn't need a hilt in his wisdom. <laughs> And a hilt stops your knuckles getting wrapped when you get it wrong, but so we didn't have one. We just got sore knuckles all the time. Thank you, George. What's the biggest technological change between filming the prequels and filming the show? What like, was the biggest you change? The lightsabers were different. Were there other like? Yes, things? the biggest change was we used that thing called the volume, which is like a three, three hundred degree wrap around. It's probably about as big as this area here, you know, to where you guys are. It wraps around, it's almost 360, but not quite, and, it, and the backgrounds are projected onto it. Well, no, they're not projected on it, they're played on it. And, and, and when you point a camera at them and move the camera, it, it alters the depth of field and stuff in the image. And you, so when you're acting on that stage, there's no blue screen anymore, no green screen, which I'm not a fan of. I don't know if you've ever read any of my interviews about the prequels, but um, I wasn't a great fan of the blue screen environment. And this just takes it away. Suddenly, if you're in the desert, well, you feel like you're in the desert. Or if you're in, we had um, in episode two or three of um, the series, we were in this big city with tower, you know, towering skyscrapers and stuff. And it, and it felt, you know, you walk in, you're sort of in that environment already. So that was a massive difference. Um, but everything else was, I mean, well, on the first, the, the second episode, the se second prequel, you know, we used the first ever digital cameras. We shot the first one on film, and the second one, we had these early generation digital cameras with huge cables coming out the back of them into a tent in the corner that sort of hummed, you know? It was so, it was so uh, new at the time. And now, of course, we've got digital cameras on our phone. You know, you can shoot Star Wars on that. You need to shoot Star Wars on a runner. <laughs> All right. In a couple of years, it'll be 30 years of train spotting. Ah. Woo! 
Do you, do you all stay in contact? Do you, are you a yes. text group? There is a little, because um, train spotting is um, used in, it crops up all the time. Um, political campaigns use the poster for train spotting. There was one recently in Britain when there was the general election that had all the British MPs, all the Conservative MPs, on, <laughs> like with their heads on our shoulders from the poster, you know? And um, so there's a little email group with all of us on it that we sort of post, you know, we talk to each other about those kind of things. Um, and so we do keep in touch. We did joke when we did T2, because that was 20 years after we made the first one. We did joke about doing a third one in our 70s, you know, <laughs> when we're all in the sort of geriatric uh, home for ex-drug users, you know, from Scotland. <laughs> Back on the back on the drugs, it might be. I mean, the full Monty just did a TV show, so you yes. can always do a dream there's funny. A, yes, there's every opportunity. I hope so. I do love those guys so much, and that, that film was the most it was an amazing experience to be in that film. And those, so we're all bonded together forever. The, the cast and uh, Danny Boyle, and um, yeah, it was. It's an amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm very, very proud of that one. Train spotting iconic film to today. Very recently, you got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. <laughs> what was that day like? Where's the boor? <laughs> <laughs> is it someone up? Is someone up pissed off in the past? I think it's like a deep woo. It's a deep what? It's a deep woo. Like it is a cheer. A woo. Deep... Well, it sounds to me like a boo from up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a star. Boo. What was that day like? Oh, it was fun. It was really, I had no idea what to expect from it, to be honest. I, I didn't, um, I didn't, I didn't really know what it would mean until I saw it. Until the, you know, they, they reveal it. The best thing was I had all my family there. I had my kids. I was with my wife, Mary. And um, my only, Esther, my daughter, wasn't able to be there because she was shooting a, she's making, she's acting in a series in Canada at the time. So she wasn't able to be there. But, so that was a great shame, because other than that, I had all my kids there, and that was, it was a real family day, it was really nice, yeah, it was nice. And when they revealed it, and you saw, you see your name down there, it was like a moment, I went, oh, God almighty, that's, that's a star with my name on it, it was good. It was nice, and I like the idea that it's there, and the best thing is, it's right next to Carrie Fisher's. I love Carrie so much. I met Carrie, uh, we became real, we became friends, you know, I was so lucky to know her because I loved her so much. As a child, I was, I mean, deeply in love with her. When I was, as a lot of men my age probably in this room will say they were as well. And um, when I met her, we, you know, we had, of course, I'd done Star Wars by this time, so we had that, we had that in common. And she just, she made, used to make me laugh, so she was so funny. We co-hosted, like, we co-hosted a, 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 during the Oscars and stuff, there's people like throw parties for a movie to try and, and we ended up co-hosting stuff at her house, which was just always such a laugh. Yeah, it's a great shame that we lost Carrie, I really, but anyway, it's a very, I couldn't believe that I was lucky enough to be right next to her on the Walk of Fame, that's nice. That's incredible. Star Wars history. It's an amazing thing. Right. Um, so you've done a lot of motorcycle-based projects, documentaries. What drives you to do this long, like long-term mo motorcycle travel? Like, what is it? Just like a glutton for punishment or something. I don't know. I loved. I, I started doing. Um, I've always ridden more bikes. I love riding motorbikes. I, um, and and I started doing sort of trips after or. Yeah, when I finished a movie, it's so intense making a film. There's so many people around, and and also as an actor, all of your sort of your sort of decision making as a human being is sort of removed from the equation, you know. So you're you're told we'll pick you up tomorrow at six thirty in the morning, and you'll be taken to. You don't have to think about where you're going. You arrive. You, you know somebody's telling you this are the scenes you're going to shoot. You. Someone asks you what you'd like for your lunch, you know, it's, you don't have to really think about anything other than the job at hand, I suppose that's why. 
So at the end of it, and there's a sort of reintegration into real life when you have to <laughs> you have to start doing all those things for yourself again. And I thought I so I started taking motorbike trips. Like the first one I remember was in Australia after uh, Star Wars. No, after Moulin Rouge, or maybe in the middle of Moulin Rouge. Took a long bike trip there, and then in then um, after uh, Big Fish in Alabama, I bought a, I bought myself a Harley Davidson down in Alabama, and I rode it back to LA. When we finished, it took me four or five days, and I thought it was a fantastic way to sort of decompress, you know. And then all of my decision making was back in my own shoulders at that point. Like, where do I stop? Where do I get petrol? What do I have to eat? All of those things made me sort of a human being again. And um, I just like stuck with it. And then Charlie and I, my friend, <coughs> were talking about doing a trip to Spain or something. And I, like, you know, from when that point I was living in London. And it's, you know, it's great to ride to Spain, that's fine. But I, I just, I read this book called Jupiter's Travels, written by a guy called Ted Simon. And uh, it changed my life really, because he rode around the world in 1971 or 72, which is when I was born. But he did it on a triumph, and he did, it took four years to do it. And he wrote this beautiful book, Jupiter's Travels. It's a really lovely book to read. You don't have to be into bikes to read it. It's just a great book about the world. And um, I started talking to Charlie about that. Like, why don't we... My ex-wife was brought up in China, and I thought maybe we'll ride to China, you know, from London. And then I was looking at the back, going, oh, what do we do? What do we do when we get there? Just come back? And so we had to, I got a world map. And I, I was looking at the world map, London, China, and then I just thought, if you keep going and you come on this page over here, you come back to London and it's pretty much a straight line. And so that became our first trip, uh, Long Way Round, which is available on Apple TV Plus or Apple TV, whatever it's called. Um, and that, that changed our lives because we did that in 2004. We did the whole African continent in 2007. We did this, the Americas in 2019. And then we just did another one that we just finished this summer, which is our fourth trip, which will be on the television next year. That's exciting. So, Woo! tune in. What, what's the longest one you, I assume it's the I think China. Long Way Round was the yeah. longest. It was over 20,000 miles. And um, it was like four and a half months. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, we, we went through some pretty amazing places. We rode through Kazakhstan, which is a fantastically different place, you know, from our sort of cultural, understanding and then we crossed Russia and we crossed um, Mongolia and um, yeah I loved I loved lots of the first trip it was all, it was it also was brand new to us we didn't know really what we were doing but we had a great time do you have a dream trip that you want to do that you haven't done yet um, I'd have places I'd like to go back to I'd love to go back to Mongolia uh, my, I, I had I, have my, I met my daughter on the first trip in Mongolia. We met, I met her in this place and, and adopted her, and she's 23 years old now. And uh, I'd love to go back there with her again and uh, explore Mongolia a little bit. I'd love to go back to Alaska. I loved Alaska. I thought that was so cool. And uh, the northwestern part of Canada I really liked. Um, there's still lots of places in America that I haven't um, Ex experienced and explored and I'd love to do that and I think traveling on a bike is by far one of the greatest ways to get to know anywhere you know so yeah lots more trips to go to. How do you handle the weather? It's like the first question that comes to my brain. Yeah well you just have to you just have to sort of uh, the riding kit you can buy these days is sort of you're good to go you've got th you know you've got vents if it's hot it's it's already waterproof and you've got, and you know, you can put layers on if it's cold. And that's, you just have to be able to stay dry, really, on a bike. I mean, you, if, if, you, if it's too cold, you, ha you just have to stop. There's no, there's no point riding and riding if you're freezing. It's not, it's pretty quite dangerous to do. So uh, you'd stop and you'd have a cup of coffee and heat up a bit. It's the wet, really. You just have to make sure you've got a really good waterproof layer and then you're all right. Speaking of important clothes, what is your favorite costume that you've ever worn in your entire career? Ooh. Which one? What? what? Christopher Robin. <laughs> you see, it's not fair to have favorite. I don't have favorites because it just wouldn't be fair to them, you know. I've loved so many. I've, I'm really lucky. I've loved so much of the work I've done. I've really, there's very few movies I've made that I didn't enjoy. There's a couple, but there's not many. 
And, um, <laughs> and so I don't like to single them out really. People ask what's your favourite movie you've been in. I, I never know what to say. I really, I've loved so many of them. There's films that have been important to me, but in terms of the costume, I mean, Obi-Wan is so iconic. That's, <laughs> came back to do the, the series, you know, it had been, like I say, it had been a long time, almost 20 years, and I went down to do some uh, a casting with uh, some of the young actors who were in the, in the series, and they wanted me to read scenes with them. We went to the Mandalorian set on a Sunday when they weren't working, and we, um, they, we, I went to a dressing room, and there was my, co I don't know if it was my original costume, but it was, it was Obi-Wan's costume hanging up, and it stopped me in my tracks, I was like, oh my god. And I put it on again, I was like, oh my god, the boots were the same pain in the ass to put on that they used to be and stuff. And, um, uh, but anyway, it was an, uh, so that one maybe is the most iconic one I've had to wear. But I, I yeah, no, I've been lucky to, I've been lucky to love most of the stuff I've done, so I wouldn't like to pick it. If you don't have a favorite role, what do people recognize you for the most, like when you're walking down the street? Uh, people, people mostly come up to me with my bike trip now because because uh, that's me, you know, and I think people, because um, that's just me being me, and so people are happy to talk about that uh, in a way where I'm not a character and something. Today it's been robots. Everyone's been talking about robots Woo! today. I, 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 I voiced a character in uh, Rodney Copperbottom, and, um, and, and today that's been the main feature of the day. It's interesting. It's very exciting. It's like yeah. a themed day. Yeah. <laughs> When you, when you prepare for a, a voice role, like Cricket or Transformer, um, how is that different from when you prepare for something live action? Well, that's different because you get to do every line. Generally speaking, the disappointing part about animations is that you tend to do it on your own. Like you go to a studio or, uh, uh, and it's just you there and the director and the producers. And then, so you don't often get a chance to actually play the scenes with the other actors, just because of logistics, I guess. Um, so, but what you do get the chance to is to do that one line over and over and over again until you're all happy with it, you know. Which, you don't, which isn't the same as if you're doing something on the camera. Of course you do several takes, but you don't like, you're not honing in to try and make it perfect. And, and that's what makes it different. That's also, for me, what makes it a bit frustrating because it, 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 you, you end up doing it for a long time, you know. And then, um, like over two years, you'll come in because I think you're there doing animation while you're doing the recording, and then they keep coming, get you to come back to change lines or to, uh, yeah, to change things. So that goes on for a long time. I'm, I like to be in and out. You know, I like to do a job and then I'm on the next one. You know, so. And then you're on your bike. And then I'm on my bike. Yeah. When you're walking around at, or when you're signing, taking photos, do you have any like favorite fan interactions? Have any fa favorite, favorite fan interactions? Favorite fan interactions. Attractions. When people have interactions. Yeah. <laughs> interactions. Sorry, I thought you said attractions. I was thinking that. <laughs> there aren't any attractions. Um, <laughs> I love it. I didn't think I was going to like it as much as I do. I really, I really, you know, I didn't do any of this until um, Anaheim when the series was released a while back. Yeah. And, I, and I, I saw. I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do the. I just had never done a convention. I didn't know what I thought it was, but I didn't think I wanted to do that. And then when I did, I said, because we're there anyway, I said, okay, I'll sign some autographs, I'll take some pictures. But I really liked it. I, I just, it's just nice to meet you all. And then um, I know it's always too short and it's frustratingly short for us as it, it must be for you, but there's these huge queues and they just try and move everyone through as quickly as they can. But we always try and, I was trying to share a moment, you know, so at least, You've, you know, you've met somebody, and I and I've always enjoyed meeting you all. So, um, it's that, it's that it makes it puts a, it, yeah, it's like it puts a face to the, you, the people who like films, and and I like making them, and you like watching them, and they get they get to meet each other. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of, I assume there's a lot of aspiring actors out here. Do you have any advice for them? I don't know. I don't really know. I think the best thing is to do it as much as you can. Like work, make films with your friends, do, you know, 
it, we're, we're in a world where there's so much, it's so easy now to be able to do, you know, with our, like I say, with an iPhone you can make a movie, write, I think watch stuff, like, it's amazing how many young actors don't, I, everyone has their generational um, references, right, and I appreciate that, and I, 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 I was born in the 70s, and the movies of the 70s were particularly good. So when I was a child, I got I got I got to see amazing movies, and and I wanted to watch older ones, and I and I, and I, I knew a lot of the older you know the actors in the 40s and 50s, the Hollywood stars in the in Hollywood's heyday, sort of knew who they were, and I, I loved like Jimmy Stewart, one of my favourite actors of all time. I love all his work. I like watching him, and I and I think as a young actor. You should be as open as you can to it. Watch as much as you can. Watch the old, watch Laurence Olivier and something. Like it's so, it's sort of not how we do it anymore, but watch it anyway, because it was, that's what was really good then. And, um, and Alec Guinness, like the films that Alec Guinness was in. I mean, he was known for Star Wars, but there's like a whole lifetime of amazing work before he put a, a page cloak on, I can assure you. And I love watching all that stuff, you know, I think you can learn by watching people that are really good at things. And so, trying to do, trying to act as much as you can in things, on stage, in in front of a camera, ah, poetry readings, I don't care what it is. I used to do a lot of music at school, I used to perform, I was a French horn player, I was in the school pipe band, I did poetry readings, anything that put me in front of an audience, just because I because I, I wanted to perform, you know, and it was all part of learning about how you do that. And then, um, so there's lots of things you can do. But I know it's a frustrating place. LA is quite frustrating because there's a lot of people want to be in the business here and there's not a great, like in New York, there's so much theater. In London, there's a lot of theater. There's not the same sort of possible. It's not quite the same here. So you sort of have to go up to make it happen yourselves, which you can do. I'm, I'm available if you need me, I can help. Jimmy Stewart, who else is on your list of kind of inspirational actors or, or favorite films? Well, yeah, I've got really some of my favorite films are sort of. Do you remember the film Breaking Away? Yeah. Does anyone remember that with the cyclist, yeah. the four, the four mates? They just yeah. finished high school and they're they don't know what they're doing. They're the son of uh, stonemasons in this town. And is it? Is it? The bicycles. What? Cutters, they're cutters. But are they in uh, Minneapolis or Indiana? Yeah. Oh my God, it was one of my favorites. One of them dreams of being a cyclist. Yeah. And he pretends he's Italian because all his favorite cyclists are Italian. And he meets this beautiful college girl who's a, he's not a college kid. He's a cutter, you know, he's a, he's a working class boy in this college town. And he meets this beautiful student girl and he pretends he's Italian because there's no way that she would speak to him if she knew she was a, he was a cutter. And then, um, oh my God, it's a beautiful film. That was one of my favorite films growing up. But I also loved, you know, I loved all the old, I loved um, uh, The Great Escape, and I loved, um, I loved the film, like I loved uh, The Getaway, Steve McQueen. I love um, those 70s movies, the 70s movies are pretty, everyone likes, everyone references 70s movies because they were so good, you know. What do you think has been kind of the biggest, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in the industry as an actor? I mean at the moment it's all over the place, I don't know because we had the streaming platforms come in and then so everyone's making TV series and not making movies and then because we, everyone's got the streaming services in their homes, less and less people are going to the cinema so nobody knows what, nobody knows how to gauge anything anymore, you know. They used to be, like I read this morning, there's an, a, 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 an article about a big movie that's just opened, they were talking about a terrible opening weekend. And I was thinking, what is an opening weekend anymore? You know, there, there isn't such a thing, because people generally aren't going to the cinema so much anymore. So um, I think it's a massive change at the moment, but I think that's just par for the course. Things change all the time. And uh, out of it will come something better. It's nice to be able to have access to everything that's ever been made on your remote control. I mean, that's pretty amazing to be able to do that. You can all go home and watch Breaking Away tonight, for instance. And um, yeah, so I think it's a big flux at the moment, but the job, is the, the game is the same, you know. We're, we're still trying to make, we're trying to move people's 
we're trying to make people feel things and we're trying to make people think about things in order to make things change or to give to make people happy or make people uh, realize that something bad is going on that maybe they hadn't thought about before that's our job as entertainers and as artists and I'm very glad to be one of them you know I, I, I feel it's a great privilege and I'm, I'm lucky and I, I thank my lucky stars every day well, you talked earlier about um, kind of finding that extra something in projects when you sign on how how do you how do you notice like when you're reading a script how do you pull that out like this is special it's just your gut. It's my gut instinct. I've got no idea. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think it's just you're reading it, and if you get that feeling like that you're reading a good book and you don't want the book to end, that's what I'm looking for when I read a script. If I, and I start seeing myself in the role, I can start imagining me in this role. That's always a good sign. But it's difficult to know. I mean, you can't always be right, and you just have to follow your instincts at the end of the day. That's really interesting. Um, and. Jumping back to Star Wars, we were talking a little about kind of the ongoing, the family of Star Wars is growing, right? There are new shows, there are new actors joining into this world. You were talking about being at Star Wars Celebration a couple years ago. When you meet new actors who are joining, like, what what's your advice for people who are kind of joining? Because it's big. I mean, this is this is pretty huge, yeah. right? What's your advice for? For people stepping into that, I don't have. I don't have any. I don't think it's. I don't think it's anyone's place to give advice, especially to actors. Actors come at this from all different walks of life and all different ways. And some people like to have a method, and other people go on their instincts. And it's all. Everyone's coming at it from a different place. But at the at the end of the day, we all have the same responsibility. Me and Vivian, you know, in the series, you know, I'm in my fifties and. It's just a small a kid, but yeah, we both have the same responsibility to be believable in these roles and to tell the story that the writer wants told using our characters, and uh, that's it. That's all. That, you know, it's not for me to tell her, give her advice because she doesn't need it. She doesn't need any. She could have given me some advice, I think, probably. But um, yeah, I don't have any advice really. Uh, it's a, it's lovely being, and it's amazing to come into a big family like Star Wars and be part of something massive like this to be part of something that means so much to people that's that is an amazing thing you know and then um, i think sometimes there can be a pressure of because some of the characters have existed as cartoons or they've existed in, uh, in other ways uh, in books or something but you know um yeah we you, you just have to trust yourself and, and and inhabit that character to do be them you know i don't know i don't have any advice for really. and as we wrap up today do you have a favorite Star Wars memory? <laughs> Big question. My favorite memory, I don't know if I'm, I get in trouble telling it though. <laughs> my, my favorite memory is at the end of episode three. What was the last one called? The... Revenge of the Sith. Something Sith? Revenge of the Sith? At the end of Revenge of... I'm just terrified I got it wrong, so I thought I'd best... You'd, I knew you'd know it. Do you know the end when I when I arrive with the baby, with Luke, to Uncle Owen and Aunt Peru? So, when, when, I, when I did that, we were in Australia, shooting in Australia, in the, in the studios, Fox Studios. And Charlie and uh, Ross and Dave, the producers on The Long Way shows, had come to Australia because we were going to do our first one after Star Wars, like a year later or something. And we thought, why don't we shoot a little promo? So we'll, we'll rent, we rented a couple of Yamaha Teneres there in Australia and we spent a weekend, probably wasn't allowed to, but we spent a weekend like riding these bikes around and we went off road and we did a bit of camping and stuff and we shot, you know, it. So they were there doing that. And, I, and the day they arrived, I was shooting, or the next day, I was shooting that end scene. So I said, guys, you're, uh, this is the end. I'm, I'm giving Luke Skywalker to Uncle Owen and Aunt Peru. So you should come and watch. And they were like, oh, right, yeah, we'll come. So I went down, they were down there. They went down before me, I came down. And now in the movie, I, I ride up on a EOP, I think it's called. I ride up and I have to get off the horse, the EOP, and I have to walk over and I, I give, I give the, I think it's Uncle Owen's over there. I give the baby to Aunt Peru here. 
and Owen comes over and they, we all look at the baby for a minute and then I walk off and I get on my Aopi and I ride away. So that was the scene. So I came down and all my mates, Charlie and the boys are sitting over here. It's an entirely blue set with a blue curtain all the way around and there's a blue disc which is a little hill top here. And, and, and here where we are is a gym horse that's painted blue. It's all it is. A, it's a gym horse. It doesn't move, it's just a gym horse, that's all it is. So I have to get, someone helps me on it. And I'm on this, here, I'm on this gym horse like this. With a plastic baby like that. And, and George is over here and goes, action! And I, and I have to go like this. That's the Aopi walking, but it's not moving, I'm just pretending. And then I think, that's probably far enough. So I stop it, oh. And I know my mates are over there going. <laughs> so I get off, and I jump down, and I walk over with a baby, and I pass the baby over, and uh, oh, oh, Uncle Owen comes over. And I'm looking at him, and we all look at each other, and I think, that's good. And as I walk away, I hear George shouting, look at the moons, look at the moons. And uh, nobody knows where the moons are, right? So we're <laughs> looking at a different moon, you know. Suddenly there's eight of them. And then I, I go back and I think, okay, now, I've got, now there's no one to help me get on the horse. Does this? So I go back over and I'm like, well, I have to go this way because I'm going that way now, right? So I have to go, and I get up, and I give them a wee look, and then I walk off like that. <laughs> So that's my favorite bit. That is an incredible story. And you have been an incredible guest. Everyone, please give for an amazing Lou McGregor. And thank you all for coming. You're just fantastic. I've loved speaking to you. And um, I'll see you, the guys, tomorrow that I'll see. See you tomorrow. Good night, uh, cheers.